Uh, so, yes, so I'm a Scala developer um, at a financial technology company called ClearScore. We're based in London, um, but we are a global, global company, also operating in South Africa, uh, Canada, Australia, and of course, my hometown, New Zealand. What today is going to be is going to be this uh, beginner-focused talk on, on using algebraic data types to model music. And then I'm going to try and like, live code and, and write a song using those models. So um, it's always good fun, because it could go either way. But it could be amusing, so yeah, stick around. If I'm working in financial technology, why am I, why am I modeling music today instead of financial products? I'll explain that, but uh, first I'm just going to outline what we're going to cover in this talk. So this is the question that I want to answer, can we write songs in Scala? I mean, I have the answer, but I want to prove it to you. Uh, on the way to answering this, I'm first going to go over describing modeling music using algebraic data types. Uh, then I'm going to cover like, imp improving the resultant API and uh, creating like, a musical domain-specific language that we can use to like, write and arrange some songs. And then I'm going to finish up by, by writing some songs on the fly. I'll get your input on that. And then uh, and we can see how some sort of song takes shape. So yeah, all right, music. Uh, a little bit on my background, my musical background. And uh, yeah, so before becoming a, so a Scala developer, my first career was in the music business, um, where I wrote songs, I played in bands, I worked in recording studios as an audio engineer. Uh, my main instrument you can see there, the bass guitar. Oh, I love the bass. Does anybody here play bass? What's your name? Well, awesome, I love the bass too, so I'm, I'm going to keep looking at you now to sort of a anchor myself, all right? So yeah, uh, I, I resist the worst part, I hate saying this in public, but like uh, factually, in New Zealand, I have to be classified as a rock star, uh, because it's true. Other, other New Zealanders, when I say that, they get angry, they're like, you know, you can't go around saying that about yourself, we're a very humble nation, I do get it, it's a very lame thing to call yourself even if it's true. I mean, maybe, maybe it's different in France. Do you go around saying, bonjour, je suis célèbre? Et toi? So, I don't know, but this is a data-driven assessment, all right? So, up here on the slide, we have data. Um, I have had some number ones, some platinum albums. I've been on the radio and TV, all that fun stuff. So, I would say, let's not fight the data, uh, but do let me share with you some highlights of this period. It's surprisingly difficult to watch, to be honest. But anyway, so my 20-something like year music career spanned some very big changes in the music business. So I did evolve too, up to a point, but I was like a rock artist and a, a rock audio engineer, so I just didn't fancy being a you know influencer on TikTok. And uh, ultimately, I, I had to make a career pivot. So what I did is I, was, I enrolled in a computer science degree um, at the University of Hertfordshire. I spent quite a bit of time doing that. It ultimately led to me uh, becoming a software engineer and specifically a Scala engineer. So yeah, so hopefully that's enough about me. I'll try not to talk about myself anymore. Um, we can talk about music. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna dive right in to this virtual instrument that I have here. And um, let's hope that comes across. Maybe I can drag that up. Oh, how are we gonna do that? Uh, that. Mm. Let's try this again. So if I... Maybe I'll end this, bring that up. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this here is uh, where I've got to in modeling these sort of musical notes and stuff. I do have some musical notes here. Dum, I've modeled dum, a note. Dum, dum, dum. That's my voice, yep. So then I uh, also modeled some drums. <laughs> so me, when I first started, I thought, oh, this is amazing, I can, I can write a whole song using my voice. But I think maybe 17 minutes later, I, I changed my mind. I thought, it's not that great. Uh, but what, I think the most important thing that I got to was being able to like uh, model a melody, right? So this is one of the, thing, the first ones I did. Let's try it again. Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you guys recognize that. Of course, being a bass player, the first thing I'm going to do with, uh, uh, with this model is like program a bass line, right? So, yeah. So this is kind of what I got to. I, I, I got better sounds than, the, uh, than my voice. I got some like guitar. I got some synthesizers. As you can see, I've like mapped my keys to, to the keyboard. So I got some synthesizers. I got this quite cool one here. I've got a piano. I'm going to show you all I'm doing. Right here. All right, yeah, I'll take any excuse to play in front of people. So, of course, cool. so this is the virtual instrument. Um, I'll look back here to the slide. I'm going to run it again. I hope it comes up. Cool. So, just a quick overview of some of the things that we can do once we've modeled these uh, model music and stuff and created a domain specific language. We'll get onto that. I'm just going to explain to you what I used to build that. So, I did indeed use Scala.js. As you saw, it was a, a web audio app. Um, what I did was I wrapped a JavaScript library called Tone.js, um, which is a, it's a really good uh, sound and audio library. Like I say, it's JavaScript. Um, but it sits on top of the lower level web audio API. Cool, so let's get on to um, looking at the musical models that are powering that, amp, that app. Yeah, so first up, yeah, well, what is an algebraic data type? Can you, who here knows what an algebraic data type is and uses them regularly? This always surprises me, and where's Lucas? I was talking to Lucas last night, and he was saying, surely everyone knows it. Not as many people know about algebraic data types as you might think. They're functional programming fundamental, but as you can see, like, the word has yet to still get out, I think. So I think some people use them without potentially knowing what they're called. I'm going to show you an ADT, and this is my ADT. This is my like, music event, right? So this is my initial effort at modeling music, which I've, I've done by describing four different music events, right? So this actually came about from an exercise I did in a book called Essential Scala. Um, it was written by Noel Welsh and Dave Gurnall. If anybody's like learning Scala and learning functional programming, I thoroughly recommend that book. And so on this first line here, what we do is we, int we introduce this overarching music event type. Uh, so that's like a sum type. And then we, underneath that, we list the possible types of music events that we can have. These are your product types. So you can see here we've got like rest, or rest at the bottom, we've got note, melody, harmony, and rest. Um, so I'm just going to clarify what like, each of these uh, music events does. I think I can go back to my instrument here, but you can't see it. So this is a note, right? Single atomic value, yep. So I'll explain a rest. A rest is just like a, a pause. You've got to have a pause at some point in a song. Maybe you could call it like an empty note. I don't know. Uh, next I've got like melody. You saw me doing that before, right? I'm like composing notes, combining notes, Perform an algebraic operation on notes to create a sequence over time. And then finally, we've got like harmony. Harmony is like uh, when you've got like more than one note being played at the same time. So this is a harmony. That's a two note harmony. Here's a three note harmony. Here's a four note harmony. I'll go for it. All right. So that harmony, if you play it on the same instrument, you would, you would typically call that a chord. Awesome. So when I first um, heard about algebraic data types, it wasn't actually that long ago, it was uh, 2022. Um, I thought, I heard the name and I thought, sounds a little bit complicated. Not complicated. It's basically just a, a way of describing our data in this expressive and type safe manner. Um, and we use the Scala type system to define data structures in a way that makes it impossible to create invalid states. We were talking earlier, earlier talk it was saying illegal states. Yep, so we can use algebraic data types to, to avoid these illegal states. And we can then pass these descriptive and expressive values around our code and use the algebraic operations to combine the values and create new values. So, and you did just see that, a note combined with another note, melody, algebraic operation. So hopefully that gives you a quick overview uh, of what an ADT is if you haven't met one before. And um, what I'm going to do now is show you like a more complete description of this music event. So you can see it's evolved a little bit from my, from my first attempt. 
Um, so first I've added this drum type here. Now, as I was like working with the model and, and writing some music, I wanted some drums. I added the drum type. I consider it to be a music event. I think it's time we included drummers. Uh, there's always a bass player, drummer, rivalry thing going on, but yeah, so drum, it's an official music event now. Yeah, and secondly, this note product type, you can see that I've added a few extra, extra fields there, right? So this evolution, it shows, it's taken me like a few attempts to get something to fit my aspirations here. So like modeling data this way, I think it's something that like you improve it the more that you do it and, and the more that you learn about the domain that you're modeling. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go through um, a few of the fields that define a note. Now, there are aspects to music that are like constantly evolving, changing. I mean, it's the same as in tech, right? It, it's very fast evolving. So music moves quite quickly too. So for example, the type of music we listen to, um, how we produce music, how we consume it. So there've been some like radical changes there. I, I got to live through that process. Um, one thing that hasn't changed so much at all is that we're still using the same set of Western music theory's note names, right? Timings, pitches, we've been using those for hundreds of years now. So what I'm talking about is like the basic diatonic notes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So apparently we've been using those since like sometime around the Middle Ages. Except in France. Hey, how long have you been using them in France? Same thing, different name. Do, re, mi, so, okay, it's the same thing, but yeah, okay, cool. So I'm sorry about that, I should, I should have done my research, but thank you, thank you for educating me. So, cool, so these are, these are the properties that we need to model in our note product type. Yeah, so first up, pitch, right? So this is like the, the actual term for the note name, um, which I guess, <laughs> I could make the French version, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. But yeah, so this is like note names, A to G. Um, I've used like another ADT, note name here, right, for modeling these. So um, I probably should have called it pitch, uh, to be honest, but that's the thing, you can, you can always change it, right? So I think at the time I thought I wanted to make it nice and easy for people using it to understand. Yeah, so here's a quick look at this note name ADT, right? And you can see that in using this note name type, only these seven note names are possible. Um, I'm gonna show you something quite cool, another way of writing this ADT. Here's the same ADT, but the Scala 3 enum, because we're all crazy about Scala 3, right? So under the hood, it's ultimately doing the same thing, but look how concise that is. Like it all fits into that little screen over there. So, so using this ADT, what it does, is it places a constraint on the values that we can use, and it guarantees type safety for a note's pitch value. So if, say, for example, I'd use a character, a uh, you know, char or a string instead, which would have been the, the obvious and traditional route, right? Then we'd be able to do things like this. So I forgot your name again, but you play the bass. Yeah, can you, can you play that note? Neither, neither can I. That's because it's not a note. So if he can't play it, and I can't play it, then what's the JavaScript sound library supposed to do when it sees that? How's, how's it supposed to play that? It's not. Le erreur d'exécution. Yeah. I, I had to, I was walking around last night practicing that. It's like some weird guy walking around France doing runtime error, runtime error. So anyway, I, I hope the pronunciation was all right, but yeah. So, so using this, this note name ADT, it's gonna prevent this particular runtime error from happening, which is fantastic. Cool, so onto the next property of, of the note product type, um, which, is, which is accidental. And this just determines whether like a note's like a sharp or a flat, so A, A sharp, A flat, this kind of thing. Next up, duration, how long we play a note for. Velocity, so velocity is specific to digital instruments, right? You don't have a, a velocity on your bass or your violin. Uh, violin. Um, so this is a controversial integer, we'll talk more about that very shortly. Um, yeah, so finally octave, so octave's just like the higher and lower versions of the same musical note. I'm actually just gonna show you because it's easier. So here's an A, here's an A, all right? This is A, B, C, D, or do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. All right, octaves, we got that? I'm not, I'm not sure if everybody wanted a music lesson today or want to talk about Scala, but you can, you can have a little bit of both. Awesome. 
So uh, I'm going to show you now how um, we can use an ADT to model the velocity value in our note model, because at the moment, velocity is, uh, is dangerous. And uh, so I said before, velocity like, is a value that determines how hard or soft a note's played on the digital instrument. And so this project provided like, a fantastic opportunity uh, to learn about and demonstrate type safety, because after all, you know, we're wrapping a JavaScript library. I'm not making fun of JavaScript, but in a simple form, it has no type safety, uh, it has no compile time checking, that kind of thing, all the things that we do like about Scala. Um, so with my background in audio engineering, uh, my default understanding of velocity is MIDI velocity. Does anybody here know what MIDI is? About five people, right. So MIDI is an acronym for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Um, it dates back to the early 80s, to the beginning of sort of digital music and sound. And it's like the standard protocol for sending digital music data between digital synthesizers, keyboards, computers. And MIDI is so ingrained now in like digital music that it would be very hard to move to something newer and potentially better. Like not a lot unlike JavaScript or, or the English language. It's, it's out there now, it's hard to get rid of it. It's a seven bit value, it's from zero to 127. Zero is silent, 127 is the loudest to write. So modeling velocity with an integer, well, you, you all know, right, it's not great because we can easily exceed 127, can have negative values, we don't want negative values. However, there's a, there's a far worse issue though in that the ToneJS API has a different implementation of velocity and it instead takes velocity values ranging from zero to one. I'm glad you're laughing, so you know where we're heading, right? And you can see up here on the slide, we're instantiating a note, uh, passing in a pretty modest 105 for velocity. Sadly, however, it is like 105 times too much for, for poor old tone JS, so we should have a listen to it. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a vocal sample. It's a beautiful vocal sample. I'm gonna play it sort of on, um, on full volume of, of one. Here we are, born to be king. Cool, all right. I'm gonna play the same vocal sample now, but I'm gonna play it at 105. I have to turn down the laptop volume a little bit because uh, it's not great before people have... Here we are, born to be king. Yeah, so it's not ideal. I, I am interested though, did anybody in here actually like that second version better? Oh, I'm so grateful, I knew it. It's because I'm in France. Everywhere else, at least a few people put up their hands. Uh, devil's advocate and all that, but yeah. Whether you liked it or not, um, it's an illegal state, right? It's not what we want. So this, this sound of flame grilled JavaScript, not the desired behavior. Ultimately, this notes uh, velocity value has an illegal state. So the solution will be to replace the velocity field's integer type with our own ADT, of which I propose the following. As you can see again, because I'm so dedicated to Scala 3, I've used a Scala 3 enum. And what I've done is I've discretized what are like 128 MIDI values into eight buckets. Now I really like the talk before I'm on iron and like using refined types. So I have used like a refined type for the octave, right? So I can, at compile time, I can restrict my values. But I've made this simple, so we've got like an expressive set of values for loudness, something that maybe a musician might produce. So um, now in looking at that, we've got this type safe set of velocity values. So we have to make like a distinct and intentional effort if we want to like, you know, blow up a synth or a, or a sampler, um, which of course you can see at the very bottom there with the napalm type, uh, because I've only, inc I only included that just so I could show you what happens if we like, you know, mistreat our equipment. So. You know, I want to make a quick, quick case as well for this um, readability and expressiveness. I remember when people first mentioned expressiveness to me, I was like, expressing what? I, I didn't quite get that. Um, obviously, now I, now I think I do. Um, so here's an instantiation of this original note case class. Um, we can read most of it, but if you're looking at that, like a first time reader looking at that, you, you can read the first four, okay, no problem, but what's 105? You, know, you can use name parameters, of course or we can just explain it with the argument name, as we've done here by passing in a value called loud. So we are, we are creating this musical DSL, right? So for me, 
as a musician, uh, the term loud definitely has more context than 105. If you, say, if you say to me, hey, can you play me a, a C105, what am I going to do? I'm going to be confused. Human runtime error, I'll be like, I might even be offended that you're trying to trick me. Uh, but if you ask me for a loud C, that's probably what I do most of the time. I can just go bump, and we're done. So, yeah. So looking at this now, this is actually a specific note. We've got all the instructions, and uh, yeah. Fantastic. So now we have a way to describe music with our algebraic data types. Uh, we can get to work. We can, we can use this to write some music. There's a little problem. At the moment, it's actually not that easy to use them. So um, we're going to have a look at creating like a simple melody. And uh, we're going to use this melody type here. I like the last talk on trees too, because you can see that this is ultimately going to be like a binary tree. I did say I've been like evolving my models a bit, and I've actually moved on from that. Uh, I've gone for like a, a linked list now, because I just had the thought that you're always going to have like a head, you're always going to have a first note in a melody, and you're never going to go that way in time, you're never going to go that way in time with your melody, so, so I changed that. Just, just as an example of, uh, of evolving as you go. So yeah, so this is um, a melody, it takes a music event left and right, notes, drums, rests, other melodies. So when you instantiate that, it looks like this. It's a very simple four note melody, by the way. It's just four of the same notes. Yeah, we can easily write a repeat method, no worries. But yeah, so this nested structure, it doesn't make for pleasant or easy writing of a melody. And of course, we can't even fit it onto an industry standard PowerPoint slide. You can see it's, it's over spilling off the page there. So you can imagine what like a whole four minute song is gonna be like writing it out in this manner. It's, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be very uh, easy to do or, or very wieldy. So the solution to this is to use builder methods or smart constructors. Um, and we can use this to define like nicer looking, more concise API. Now before I go over builder methods I used in more detail, I'll quickly show you what we want that last four note song to look like. Here we go, one liner. I know everyone in here loves one liners. We could also do it like this. I think that makes a lot more sense, right? So this is what we want to use the builder, builder methods to achieve. Not only does the syntax really speed up the process of writing out some tunes, but we can create like readable notes and melody sequences that like musicians could read. We can like attempt to bridge the gap between writing music and, and writing code. So um, I'll do a quick like overview of uh, of the builder methods that I used, some of the implementations. But I do want to obviously get on to doing this this song demo because it's kind of fun. Yeah. So first up, um, here are the single note valves that I'm using there for these fundamental note names. So you know, purely so we can start like the note definition with the name of the note rather than the actual you know, word note as a case class instantiation. And if you're wondering well, you know, why we're getting away with only passing the note name into that in the, in the constructor there, it's because we have these uh, default parameters here. So, so we only need to pass in the note name to instantiate a note. Of course, this is always going to result in like a, uh, a quarter note on full, natural, third octave, so for that, we have some different methods we can use. In this one here, we can take the octave. So again, I, I did this, like passing the octave into the constructor, because I liked the way that it looked when I, when I wrote it. I, I liked it like, aesthetically. Um, but for the rest of them, like pitch and duration, I've actually used like, um, other methods. We can like method chain. Yeah, so say this is a good example. So sharp and flat. Um, this actually calls some other methods, but See, I say like, it'll set the sharp or flat, it doesn't really set anything because we're going to return like a new note that's sharpened or flattened from the original, uh, you know, going in sort of functional style where we're looking at working with immutable data structures. Yeah, so you can see that it's calling this other sharpen and flatten method, so let's take a quick look at that. Now here's the sharpen method, um, it's a small section of it anyway, it's just for the, the note A, because it's quite a long method. Um, so we're pattern matching on the note, and we're returning a copy of that note half a step higher than it currently is. So if we had like an A, it becomes an A sharp. If we have an A sharp, it'll become a B, this kind of thing. Uh, next up, we have these uh, duration methods. So you can see there's nothing too complicated here. Like um, again, it's simply just returning copies of the existing note object, uh, but with the new length that we want. And one of the best things about these, these builder methods is that 
there's no great like learning uptake. They're just very simple, but they, they do wonders for your API. Same for velocity, like duration, new note, copy of the previous, but with our, our new velocity value. Yeah, and then combining notes, so I, I use a plus for that. Uh, that symbol's been quite useful for that kind of thing. Um, and you can, you can thank Scala for the ability to actually name a method with a plus sign. So um, essentially we have an algebraic operation, we're just calling that, that melody constructor there. And yeah, and the repeat method. So again, just defining how many times we're going to repeat uh, a music event. And you know, repetition is one of you know, music's foundational properties, right? So I do know that like you know, PhD students studying experimental music, that they might disagree with me. Uh, but normally the music that, that people tend to listen to and like uh, has some repeats and stuff in it, some patterns. Otherwise, you just have people like you know, banging on different resonant entities and sort of yelling in different periods. So we do need repetition. And so here, um, asterisk, it's just the repeat method, but I'm just trying to make the DSL look better. So, yeah, and then finally I've got this, this pipe symbol method. Again, this is just like uh, the plus, but I can use it to indicate the end of a bar. So, yeah. It does exactly the same as the plus, um, but it's just, like I say, just all about making the sort of music domain specific language like, look like something that I might want to read as a musician. And I'm hoping that you agree that that looks better than that. So, awesome. So those are the methods that we need to make the description look as sort of natural as possible um, for describing a single melody uh, or tune. But if we, what if we want to write a whole song? So for this, I have this song type here. Hopefully title and tempo are self-explanatory. Uh, don't worry about swing this year, but uh, all voices, what that's going to be is going to be like a, uh, a list where we can place instruments and then place the music events inside those instruments. So for example, um, we're going to have a channel voice. This is an example of one of the channel voices, of course. I, I picked the bass. So the bass channel is a channel voice, and it takes a music event. So I can write a bass line. I can pass it into the bass channel, pass it into the song. Hopefully it'll play. And ultimately, it's going to enable a description of like a complete sort of multi-voice song in the vein of an actual musical score. And this, this here uh, is, is hopefully an example of that uh, DSL in action. It's an instantiation of like a you know, whole song. Um, it's fairly short, but it's got drums, bass, guitar, piano. And I do feel that now we've got something that's expressive, that's uh, readable, and it sort of more closely resembles maybe not so much a score, but like a chord chart. That's something that I'd, I'd be able to use to play with, I think. So that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, let's have a little listen to, to what it sounds like. So that is that. Which brings us now uh, to the live demo. So uh, looking forward to this. Let me just uh, bring my IntelliJ up. Cool. Everyone can see that okay? Think it's all right? Yeah, so here you can see we've got these, this all voices type. We're passing in hats already, right? I've got this hi-hats channel. Um, I'll show you what hi-hats are. So it's like, um, right. it's just like the little symbol here for keeping time. It's the first part of our, of our drum kit. We're obviously going to need to add a little bit more to that. So let's go back here. First thing we're going to need is a, uh, a kick drum, right? It's a dub-dub one, right? 
a lot like in the club. So we do need to put it inside a kick channel. I'm actually just going to stop the other thing because it's kind of annoying me. Right, here we go. So first up, we've got a nice sounding kick here, vinyl kick. Do you guys want like a sort of pop song or do you want a dance song? Put, put up your hands if you want a dance song. Not that many. I heard that like France was like the place for dance music, but I haven't, I haven't had a good enough response, so you're going to get a sort of pop rock song. Oh, hang on, we don't need to do a bar there. So we're going to do like a, a kick on the one, right? So we're going to do, do. We, only, we only want the kick on the one and the three for this sort of classic beat, so we're going to rest. We're going to do a rest for a quarter. Now we can just be a little bit lazy. We can just loop that. We can keep that going. Let's just have a listen to that. All right, all right, here you go. One, three, all right. One, two, three, all right, all right. Is it too slow? Is it too slow? Do you want me to speed it up? You're, you're nodding, you can, you can have it faster. 125. Hang on a minute. I think I need to go and do it in the code, don't I? Here we go, yeah, 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 125. All right, so that's obviously what tempo's for. We can define how fast it's going to be. We need a snare drum. You can see my little comment here, all voices end. That's because when I did this uh, talk in Spain, I had it, I accidentally put a, one of these instruments outside the all voices and I was on stage struggling. And then Sebastian, who wrote Scala JS, just goes, yeah, you're outside the all voices. So I was, okay, thank you. So if, if I do start making a mistake, I'm expecting some help. All right, so the, the snare's a bit different to the, um, to the kick. If the kick's on the one and the three, the snare's gonna be on the two and the four. So we're gonna go vinyl snare. Um, I just completely contradicted myself. Rest quarter, final snare, all right. That's gonna be cool, it's only gonna go once. So just again, loop that. Cool. Yeah, and you can see down below there, we're compiling to JavaScript each time I save. Let's try that. All right, all right, there's a beat. We've heard that beat before. I think they call it the money beat. It's like the most famous drum beat in the world. It's like Billy Jean, ACDC, Eminem, I don't know. All the artists use it. All right, what's coming next? Do you want next to some, some piano or, or some bass? He's, he's saying bass. All right, fantastic. I'm glad you said that. I'm actually going to use this FM synth channel to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it pretty simple straight initially, right? So I'm just going to put in like an E. I need to set the octave. So you can see now why I want to pass that octave in to the constructor, because that's probably a better way of saying E1. We're going to do like a driving bass line, right? So I'm going to do eighth notes. And uh, I'm going to repeat this eight times. Oops. There we go. And we got that. Eight times. All right. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a bar line there. I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to go into D. Let's go D, and I'm going to go down to A, and I'm going to go back to C. I'm going to get rid of this bar line. I'm going to loop that. Kind of going to hope it works, and I hope it sounds good. Here we go. That type, that type of synthesizer is joining the notes together. It's not very drivey. I mean, we could try like, um, could try just this bass channel here. Oh, hang on. Let's just try it with my voice bass and we can confirm that. <laughs> Who's actually going to tell me that sounds terrible? I'll probably believe you. So we'll just go synth based channel. Also, well, I'm going I'm to crack on because I do, I do realize that uh, you know, time is... Oh, I've got a little bit of time. I'm sure you guys have many questions. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just copy this whole thing here. And I'll put it down here. And I'll just go guitar channel. Merely finally guitar channel. 
I'm, I'm just basically like doubling that up with a different instrument. Those of you who are paying attention will see that this should be the same octave, but I've got these guitar samples pitched an octave higher, so don't be surprised. But this should just make the, uh, the bass sound a bit bassier and, and punch out the, the bass line a little bit more. All right. All right. Not too bad. We'll do some chords, eh? I'll show you some chords. So what we can do is we can define them up here, I think. So I could define these on the, on the API, right? I could define these with methods and you could just import and you'd have like a whole lot of these chords already going. But I'm gonna go like E minor. I'm gonna go this, I'm gonna go harmony. Harmony type for this. And we're gonna pass in the notes that make up an E minor. So we're gonna have an E, a G, a B. I'm actually like, hmm, let's go F sharp as well. Because this is a beautiful chord. Uh, it's an E minor nine. You know what's going to happen? It's going to sound very awkward because it's going to be in the same. So we need to maybe pop this here. We'll try that. What we'll do is we'll just test this out first. We'll right? make sure this chord thing is going to work for us. So here's a lead guitar channel. Let's go piano. Yeah, I've got this moody piano channel. I'm, I'm thinking it's the way to go. I don't want to come in straight away and just, well, actually, no, I will. I will. So we'll just go E minor, E minor. You know what? I've confused myself there. We'll just go like this, E minor loop, right? And we'll have a listen first and we'll see what happens. So I should have renamed the variable E minor 9. Right, let's go. All right. All right. It's hard to listen to, but it does work. So what I think we can do, we can actually like not even change chords in the song. We can just go up here. So I'm going to call it E minor 9. I oh, know Roman's going, why don't you use the shift F6? Shift F6. All right, E minor 9. So we'll rest. We'll do a rest. I'll wrap this first of all. So we're going to loop whatever we do. I'm going to rest on the 1. I'm going to go rest for a quarter. And then we're going to do a plus E minor. So we can just loop that. Try that. So that should just be like, go, go. about three minutes left. Can you live with that pedal point motif thing going on there? And we can do a melody or do you need me to change the chords? No response, no worries. I'm just going to do, I'm going to crack on and do a little melody and then I think we're going to be done. So uh, we're going to go piano, piano channel. I'm going to do like a, uh, I'm going to go again, I'm going to go E, G, B. Um, of course, comma is not going to work there. We're going to need to do plus. EGB, uh, and we'll do that F sharp. Uh, mm, EGB D maybe. No, 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 definitely F sharp. And of course, we're going to make that higher. So we'll go four. All right, oops. All right, it's not going to do anything other than play once. So let's just go and loop that. All right, so listen. Let's go. I don't know why that's not playing. I can't hear anything. Piano channel. E-G-B-B sharp. Let's try something else. Let's try a lead guitar channel. Let's try again. I think it might be because I didn't refresh, all right. No, I cannot hear that. Okay, let's try, try using my, my voice bass and see if we can hear it. I think that's done. Hey, hang on, hang on. You know what? What we are missing. Yeah. So I'm going to summarize, do a quick summary, because uh, that is all we have time for. 
I just want to say thanks for staying the entire time. Uh, and uh, so we looked at using algebraic data types to describe musical data, musical events, and musical arrangements. We then looked at how we could make that, those models more usable by using builder methods to, uh, to improve our sort of domain-specific language. I mean, you could see not just for this musical language, but you could use that for any domain-specific language, right? And then we, we finally we demonstrated this in use uh, by writing that simple tune there. Obviously going to be a smash hit in France. So, can we write songs in Scala? All right, all right, thank you very much. That's very kind, that's very kind. But I'm going to take like, um, some explicit views on that from you. I'm going to stand up here and answer a few questions. Of course, because I'm a rock star, I'm only going to answer the questions I like uh, and if I, if I like the look of you. So, but yeah, by, by all means, ask me some questions. Oh, so that, that was like New Zealand humour. Like, uh, I'm going to answer any question. Yeah. Um, do you know that there was a library which is called Tidal Seekers, and it enables you to play music like this uh, using code in Haskell? Really? Yes, it's quite good. Um, the DSL is uh, very expressive, uh, especially uh, when you build rhythms. Okay, amazing. Oh, thank you. I might, I might look into that. I'll find you afterwards and I'll yeah, I'll get you to elaborate. So thank you. Same type of question. Uh, do you, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Yeah. You know Lily Pond. Lily Punk. It's Lily Pond. It's it's a um, it's a tech based uh, thing for writing uh, music. So they have a very concise notation. It's mostly used for writing classical music, yeah. but people are also doing modern. Uh, pop songs or whatever you want in it. Um, so, so for, for your, your um, let's say, your syntax for writing music, you might take inspiration there, I think. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I'll find you too. <laughs> yeah, we can talk more. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever heard of Dr. Martin Codrington? <laughs> so he, he started a, a channel on, on YouTube about expressing music in category theory. And then he unexpectedly died. After oh, no, I knew like episode six, so he never finished. Okay. So we don't know how to transform these categories into music because he's not with us anymore. We're waiting on you to finish this. <laughs> I'll do it next week. Hey, sorry, I have a question. How difficult would it be to, to hook it up to a VSTI, like virtual instruments? Like? Yeah, I thought you were going to ask me how difficult would it be to like, get AI generated. I'm waiting for that question. But that one there, I've thought, I've thought of that as well. I mean... I don't know, like um, I don't know the like API for VSTs, but you know there's other types of plugins as well. But I said I was a studio engineer, so I was using like Logic Audio and Pro Tools for like I don't know 20 years or something. So like I have it in mind. But, I mean, I started working on like a little bit more of a formal attempt at doing a music library for Scala, but it's, it's slow going, and uh, I'm sort of learning as I go. And pe people keep coming up to me after these sorts of things and saying, "Hey, can I get involved?" But then uh, you know I don't hear back from them, but. <laughs> It's okay, I don't feel bad about that, but, yeah. Um, do you plan to add a feature to, like, read a music sheet and transform it to music? No, because, because <laughs> I'm, not so sure, I'm not sure that it's, uh, I'm, just not, I'm not sure that it's, uh, my guess is, like, instant is being able to, I think there might be like easier ways of doing it now with your like digital audio workstations. I think that most of us when we're programming with these things we use like the grid operators. So I think of more value would be like, you know, dragging your notes onto the grid. I mean, does anybody here use recording software like to record? You do, yeah. So I mean, do you use notation or do you use the grid editor? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, I feel like that's the new way. When they first started using notation, of course, they had no computers, so it was fantastic. Uh, but like you know, now I think we have like slightly more easily to visualise tools. So yeah, but so thank you, great question, thank you. Is the code uh, available anywhere online? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are you offering to get stuck in and help? Not really, okay. but <laughs> just curious about. You yeah, know. It's, I've, got, I've got some code. I'll I'll share it. Yeah, no cool. worries. We'll switch off to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much.